Thank you, Zach, and Hope. Uh, the songs really lead beautifully into the message, especially what Hope was saying about uh, King Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, way into the message, and we'll save uh, King Nebuchadnezzar for later. But uh, this morning, as uh, Valerie and I were getting into our car, I was out before she was, and I was looking at our front lawn, and, and there were three trees on my lawn that have yellow ribbons around them. This is not like the song. These are yellow ribbons that have a special meaning because in a couple weeks, a truck will come by and a guy with a chainsaw will come out and cut down those trees and I won't be sad for a second. They're bad trees, they gotta go, they gotta cut down, and that's what the yellow ribbon's for. In the passage we're looking at this morning, there's a man that we see in this passage who in a sense has God's yellow ribbon around him and he will be cut down as we'll see in the story. His name is Herod Agrippa and uh, he's a bad tree, and he simply has to cut down. And he is the uh, kind of the prototype or profile of what we would call a tyrant. History is littered with the destruction of what tyrants have brought into the world. We think in modern times, you go back to Pol Pot and Cambodia, the killing fields, and 1.5 million people were cut down for a political agenda. If you think of Mao Zedong, and the cultural revolution, the people's revolution, 40 to 70 million people were starved to death for a political agenda. And of course, you have to mention Hitler. And when you study what he was all about, he's just uh, the profile of the ultimate tyrant. And uh, 50 to 80 million people, it's hard to estimate, they say died because of this man's war that he brought as the most uh, violent war in history all because of one person's vision and he exalted himself. It's easy to see that after the killing has stopped, the person was a tyrant. But in the passage we're in this morning, we're in Acts chapter 12, uh, verses 18 to 24. We're gonna see here's a potential tyrant and maybe as we study the passage and see the four things in it, uh, something could be done before the killing starts. So here's the Bible telling us what a tyrant looks like. There's four things. And as we look at this, we see that tyrants put themselves above everything, above all other concerns, above God and above people. Secondly, we see in the passage this morning that tyrants, they try to maintain the image of total control, that they have control over everything. And thirdly, they're very insecure because they can't maintain total control. It's impossible to do that. And fourthly, tyrants just cannot match God. And we're going to look at that at the end of the, the message, contrast Jesus and Herod. And so we're in chapter 12, and I'm going to repeat the first four verses from last week because it fills out the profile of Herod. But we see here from Herod that he puts himself and his political agenda above everything, above all concerns. We read in verse one, during that same time, King Herod began to mistreat some who belonged to the church. He ordered James, the brother of John, to be killed by the sword. Herod saw that some of the people liked this, so he decided to arrest Peter too. And Herod arrested Peter he put him in jail, handed him over to be guarded by 16 soldiers, and he really only had one plan for Peter, the same thing that he did to James. Now, if you went into Herod's Ancestry.com, it's a tyrant tree. Like all the Herods shed blood. His grandfather, Herod the Great, was on the throne when Jesus was born and came into the world, and you remember, he was the baby killer. His son, Herod Antipas, is the one that had John the Baptist's head cut off just to please his wife, put the head on a platter, presented it to her. This is Herod Agrippa, and you could say he wants a grip on power. He was raised in Rome. He is half Jewish, but really Roman in heart. His vision for the world is Roman, and some would say he was a Machiavellian. So if you know Machiavelli, that whole concept of the prince in that book where the prince does anything he has to do to hold on to power, it's all about power. Mao Zedong said power comes out of the barrel of a gun. And so uh, that's part of the, the psyche of a tyrant. 
Often the political vision is stated in this way. It's for the good of the people. It's for the good of humanity. Some must be sacrificed. And so that's the way that it's worded. It's for Pax Romana, for the peace of Rome that we have to crucify thousands of people. Joseph Stalin purged Russia of 20 million of his own countrymen for the good of humanity. It's unbelievable, and when we read history and even dare to look at it, it can be very uh, unsettling, very disheartening. And we have to remember like the long view of history. Tyrants don't have the last word. God has the last word, and we're gonna see that in the story this morning. We need to remember those who reflect on history deeply and call to mind their words. Tertullian, one of the church fathers, said something very important for uh, believers to hold on to. He was an apologist, a defender of the faith, himself a martyr, and said these words. He died in 225 AD and said these words to his enemies. We multiply wherever you mow us down. The seed of the church is the blood of the church. The blood of the martyrs is the very seed for the kingdom. A hundred years later, Jerome said these words. The church of Christ has been founded by shedding its blood, not the blood of others. By enduring outrage, not inflicting it. Persecutions have made it grow. Martyrdoms are its crown. Those are great, great words. And so this first point we see that the tyrant puts himself above everything. He exalts himself above God and certainly above the people he's ready to sacrifice. Herod also, secondly, teaches us this morning that tyrants do everything they can to kind of maintain an illusion of control, that they control everything, they manage everything. Verse 18, it says the next day, this is the day after Peter was released. Remember, the angel helped him break out of jail. After that day, it says the soldiers were very upset and for good reason. And they wondered what had happened to Peter. Herod looked everywhere for him, but could not find him. So he questioned the guards and ordered that they be killed. Imagine 16 guards. He just wiped them out like that. And it was all about managing his image and damage control and looking good and appearing as though he has everything under control, cold and calculating. People are nothing as long as he is able to push forward his agenda. Saddam Hussein is a person we ought to mark in history in our own recent times. Not long ago, he brought destruction to the earth. A political leader, as a young man, rose in the Ba'athist party in Iraq. And he rose through the ranks in the Machiavellian way. Like whatever it took to get power, he took it. In his very first public political meeting, he took out a piece of paper and read the names of people in the party that he felt wouldn't be 100% loyal to him. And they were shocked to hear their name and immediately they were arrested, immediately brought outside. And then he put a gun in the hands of all his party members that he chose and their job was now to execute their own comrades. He then finished it off by taking a gun and killed his best friend. This is how Saddam Hussein started a cult of fear and control. He was called the Butcher of Baghdad. He then launched a war against Iran and hundreds of thousands of people died on both sides. He was all about power, everything he could do to enhance his power. On one occasion on the battlefield with uh, Iran, he had two of his own generals executed because they made a strategic retreat and he said to them before they were executed, Iraqis never retreat, and they were just gunned down. And it was all about maintaining the illusion of total control, and we know how his life ended. Uh, he was pulled out of a hole and, and executed by his own people. And so there's this exalting of self above all else, this maintaining the illusion of self-control, and these kind of tyrants, we see thirdly, are very insecure because they can't maintain that control. 
total control is, well, that's God. Only God is totally in control. And we see this come out in verses 19 and 20. So after this embarrassment of Peter being taken out of jail and released, we read, later Herod moved from Judea and went to the city of Caesarea where he stayed. Herod was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, but the people of those cities all came in a group to him. And after convincing Blastus, the king's personal servant, to be on their side, they asked Herod for peace because their country got its food from his country, really from him. He was in power and so fed them. So here's the deal, here's what's happening. Herod's ego has been deflated. Uh, he suffered you know, in his image because of what happened with Peter. It looked embarrassing. He's not under control or having everything under control. And so he's incompetent and he deals with it by just killing 16 of his own men. And then goes off on a kind of club med vacation to Caesarea, Caesarea by the sea. And uh, again there, it's all about, well, here's something I can control. Here are these people from Tyre and Sidon that he's very angry with. We don't know the reason. And they get their food from him. And so there's this strange thing that happens between him and them with regards to food. And uh, we read these verses uh, 21 and 22. It says, on a chosen day, Herod put on his royal robes and sat on his throne and made a speech to the people. They shouted, this is the voice of a God, not a human. That was an unbelievable thing to hear. And why are they saying this? I mean, this man's a tyrant. He's angry with them. He controls the food supply. And really, they're just being very smart. They worked through this guy, Blastus, who worked for Herod. And really what they're saying is, well, he feeds us, we better feed his ego. So whatever we've got to say, we'll say it to him. It'll be music to his ears. Flattery will get you everywhere with uh, this tyrant. Now, what's really interesting in this story is that we have a partner account from Flavius Josephus who wrote at the same time. He's a contemporary of Jesus, lived during Jesus' time. And while Luke is writing history, this Jewish historian is also doing history, and he writes about this same story. This was a very famous story that went out. It probably would have been on the news uh, back then. And uh, so I'm going to read a little bit from uh, Flavius Josephus, and it gives a little bit more of, of the picture of what happened on that day. It says, on the second day of the spectacle, he put on a garment made wholly of silver. It was completely silver, kind of like sequence outfit. Think of a rock star, you know, in the spotlight and a discotheque, something like that. Really attractive. Of truly wonderful texture and came into the theater early in the morning. There the silver of his garment being illuminated by the, uh, the fresh reflection of the sun's rays, shone out in a wonderful manner and was so resplendent as to spread awe over those who looked intently upon him. Presently his flatterers cried out one from one place and another from another that he was a god. And upon this the king neither rebuked them nor rejected their impious flattery. But he shortly afterwards looked up and saw an owl sitting on a certain rope over his head and immediately understood that this bird was the messenger of ill tidings and he fell into the deepest sorrow. So in the Roman you know, mythology, this was a bad omen and he knew right away he was done. And Josephus goes on to say that he was struck uh, right in the meeting with intense pain in his gut and five days later, he died. So this man, Herod, is, is, he's an irony in himself. And we see someone who is glorious on the outside, but he's literally rotting on the inside. He portrays having total control, but he's totally insecure. He acts like a god, but he's put down like a dog. He persecutes the church to spread his fame, but really what happens is the word of God will spread in the end. So there's an irony going on here. 
And really, it's because he cannot match God. He is opposing God by what he's doing, whether he knows it or not, he is opposing God. This is like the story of Voltaire, the great French philosopher. Perhaps you heard that story in his life at some point, he actually said that 100 years from now, the word of God will be, it'll be done. There will no longer be Bibles in this world. Voltaire died like all people die, and strangely, the first uh, Bible publication place uh, in France was in his house. The Bible Society, it was actually the first Bible Society. I don't know how it happened. I read this, uh, Don Jr. sent this to me this week, and it was right in his own house. They were sending the Bible out from the very place he said it would be finished. The Bible's still here. We just mentioned Voltaire. So tyrants oppose God, but eventually they all lose. And it would seem now that God was done with the Herods. They had shed a lot of blood. And when we read this, of course, you know, God has no desire in the death of the wicked, but this man was killing his children. How would you feel if someone killed your children? I mean, how would you feel? Well, these are God's children. And so God's done with Herod. And we read in verse 23, because Herod did not give glory to God. This was like, this is the last straw. An angel of the Lord immediately caused him to become sick and he was eaten by worms and died. But here's the contrast. God's message continued to spread and reach the people. Once Jesus said, for all who exalt themselves, they will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. We open the service with that truth from Philippians 2. Jesus humbled himself. He made himself nothing. He who was everything made himself a servant, made himself obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, and because of this, he was highly exalted. Tyrants do the opposite thing. They exalt themselves. If you go in their countries, a, a country run by a tyrant, usually there's statues everywhere, there's big portraits everywhere, and the glory goes to him as though he were a god. Think of North Korea. That's exactly what's happening there now. We need to remember the lessons of the Bible and the lessons of history. Hope mentioned Nebuchadnezzar a while ago. And he's a, a real powerful lesson. And God was warning Nebuchadnezzar of what was coming. Here was a man who built up Babylon to such a high level, it was called a, a wonder of the world, one of the seven wonders of the world. And he was the, it was the kingdom of gold. He was the, the head of this empire. And he had an ego <laughs> that was so big, it had to be cut down. He didn't give glory to God. And so Daniel warned him, O oh, king, the dream you had about the tree, the great tree that gave shade to the whole world, that's cut down, you are the tree, you will be cut down. And if you repent, it won't happen. But he didn't repent, and so he was driven from his throne because of insanity. And seven years later, he repented, he called out to God, acknowledging that God makes everything, including him. All that he has, the grace we were singing about this morning, it's all a gift. It all comes from God. That's a lesson in the Bible. We see the same lesson played out in history, and here's a real strange one. You would think that Saddam Hussein would have learned this lesson because he was a student of Nebuchadnezzar. He admired him so much, he modeled his whole political regime and his strategy after that of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed Jerusalem, and Saddam Hussein said, I'm going to do the same thing. There are three things God made that he should never have made. Iranians, Jews, and flies, and I'm going to take care of all three. In 1990, he launched Scud missiles into Tel Aviv and into Jerusalem. And I'd been from there a month earlier, so it really hit me when I saw this happening on my TV screen. And we know what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, and we know what happened to Saddam Hussein. Here's a guy who minted coins with his picture and Nebuchadnezzar's picture on the same coin. And in it, he said, from Nebuchadnezzar to Saddam Hussein, the Babylonian Renaissance has started. And it just, it didn't happen. The Bible predicts a worse tyrant than any tyrant imaginable. The granddaddy of all tyrants is 
warned about in the Bible. And this is a person that's going to come into the world that has not come into the world yet. And we see that same profile, all the same thing about all the past tyrants are true in him, but to a higher level. He's called the Antichrist. In the last book of the Bible, he's just called the beast. He is such a horrible person. And I want to read some of the verses because I think they bring all the themes that are really one theme together this morning. Verse 6 of Revelation 13. It says, The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life. Listen to this. The Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Can you see the two extremes? The tyrant and the Lamb of God. The one who slays anyone the one who allowed himself to be slain. And so it's as though the book of Revelation is warning us that the world receives tyrants as a kind of judgment. God knows what the world needs to bring people to Jesus Christ, but his time will be short, three and a half years. Listen to the words of Abraham Lincoln. I think one of the greatest servant leader politicians the world has ever seen, and it's, he speaks like a prophet. Abraham Lincoln said this in 1858, our reliance is in love of liberty, which God has planted in us. Our defense is in the spirit which primed liberty as the heritage of all men in all lands everywhere. Destroy this spirit and you have planted the seeds of despotism at your door. Familiarize yourselves with the chains of bondage and you prepare your own limbs to wear them. Accustomed to trample on the rights of others, you have lost the genius of your own independence and become fit subjects of the first cunning tyrant who rises among you. Wow, that's like, that's prophetic, that's powerful. And so rightly, glory belongs only to God. It's only fitting to exalt God. To give glory and honor to a tyrant or to anyone is insane. And it'll be done. It'll be given to the Antichrist. We close this morning with seeing that God humbled Herod in three ways. Uh, John Piper uh, really says it well. The chapter begins with Herod on top. He's killed James, he's put Peter in prison, he looks triumphant. Then God intervened. God snatched Peter from his murderous grip. Peter was set free, James dies, but he gives testimony to the truth of God. Secondly, God then judges Herod, both by the way, by the agency of an angel. And Herod is judged. He's given five days to get it right, you're just a man, you're not a God. The third thing God did to humble Herod was to exalt his son, Jesus Christ. And he does this, we see in the last verse, verse 24, that the word of God continued to spread. The fame of Jesus Christ continue to spread. Isn't that the way it should be? Isn't that the way it should be in all of our hearts? That when we hear the name of Jesus, we, we just, we smile. We feel good because he laid down his life, he sacrificed himself for us. Herod glittered in the sun even though he was a murderer. Jesus Christ wore a garment that had a label in the back that said, made by mom. <laughs> and then he laid down his life. Our beautiful Jesus Christ. We need to get very personal about this now. It's easy for us to hear this and go, those tyrants, they're really bad guys. I'm sure God cuts them down. But you know, Jesus came into the world to deliver us from the worst tyranny of all, our own sinful desires. We look in the mirror, and there was a time in my life where I looked in the mirror and said, there's the tyrant. It's me. I'm my own enemy. And I realized only Jesus could save me from me. 
only Jesus could save me from the tyrant inside. And so I put my faith in him. And now I feel like I'm set free. I'm set free to fight with him against the tyranny that is still in this world. Would you stand with me? Join with me in prayer this morning. Father, we come before you and we humble ourselves before your sovereign hand. You are the one that has total control of, over everything that happens upon the earth. It is your wisdom and your power. The kingdom is yours. We live and breathe because of your grace. Father, may our eyes be open to see that Jesus fills the greatest need we have, the one who is the sacrifice for our sins. We exalt him this morning. If there's anyone here this morning that's never done this, Father, I pray even now that your spirit would be drawing them. May your prayer be this, Lord Jesus, I see the tyranny of sin inside of myself. I see you as my savior. I call on you to save me right now. Become my Lord. Deliver me. Amen. May the love of God the Father, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the beautiful peace that comes when you put your trust in him be with you. You are dismissed. God bless you. 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 God bless you.